people's faces keep freezing uh, so I'm hoping that you can hear me if you can't then please let me know uh, if you have any questions at all at any point in the session please ask or, or ask at the end uh, so as I say most of you have frozen so I'm hoping you can hear me uh, I thought I'd begin by showing, showing you some of the cameras that I've used during my career I've been a photographer for 30 years this is a camera that I used uh, 30 years ago. It's actually a 19... ...use that. I used to use this huge metal camera, which uh, cost a fortune. I uh, used, used to use 120 film, uh, really heavy. I guess your iPhones would probably take a photograph that's nearly as good as they used to. I've got a huge case under here with about £6,000 worth of camera. digital camera technology and this is an old Nikon film camera that I used to use you put your film in the back there and uh, yeah have to get it processed at the lab or go in the dark room these days I use the my Nikon D800 there which is a very high-end digital camera that's about five thousand pounds worth of gear there yeah so my I've got a longer lens on this camera which is a D500 so all that kind of gear I'm going to talk to you today. I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully, this will work. So, and Chris, can you see? Maybe I can't hear anybody. Let's just uh, skip that for a minute. Yeah, Chris, we, can can see, we can see that. Yeah, I can see it. You can see it. You can see it. Okay. And could you see it? Yeah, when I press play, you can still see that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So today I'm going to have to, I'm going to squeeze about four hours worth of kind of lessons into one hour. So I'm going to get through it fairly quickly. Uh, if, if it's some of it's a little bit complicated so if you have any questions we'll be going over this over the next few weeks but I'm going to introduce it to you and then uh, we can, as I say if you have any questions at all please ask me don't don't worry if some of it's a bit confusing so today we're going to look at the camera we're going to look at exposure and shutter speeds and apertures we're going to look at lenses and we're going to get to know the camera that I delivered to those people uh, who got one of the Panasonic's today so a very quick history of photography. Uh, so cameras have been used for over a thousand years. Artists have used something called the camera obscura, which is essentially a light tight box with like a pinhole in. And that, if you, if that allows artists to actually to see, to see images. Uh, they, would, uh, they would use these boxes as a drawing aid. Uh, photography itself, they say the first photograph was taken in 1826, I think by a Frenchman, Nipsip for Nips, although Fox Tolbert, an English guy, was also exploring photography at the same time. So it's only about 200 years old photography is. Uh, this just gives you a very uh, quick uh, overview of some of the key moments in photography. I think one of the, the big moments was 1888 there. That was uh, Kodak sells the first commercial camera. They were called box brownies. You would buy the camera for a pound and it would have eight, you could take eight photographs in it. And then you sent it back to Kodak and they sent the prints back. And that was the first one that photography started to become revolutionized. Uh, so this is just a few different cameras. Uh, I, in the top right hand corner, you'll see an AE1 program. That was one of my first cameras. Uh, and the camera that I use there is in, the, in the bottom right hand corner. So it just shows you how the technology has moved on so rapidly in one lifetime. Now, photography is really, really simple. Cameras are very, very simple. Although the camera that I've delivered to you is full of, of options and menus and settings, essentially all a camera is, is a light type box. It's a light type box, uh, usually with a lens for the light to go through, a way of controlling uh, that light using an, uh, a thing inside the uh, lens, which is called an aperture, uh, which controls how much light gets into the camera. And then there's also a shutter inside the camera that lets the light in and, and you can control how much light comes in using different shutter speeds. Now, in order to make a correct photograph, although I use that term advisedly, 
you need to get your exposure correct. And basically the exposure is how much light is coming into the camera to, to make your photographs. You might want to make a very dark photograph when you wouldn't want a lot of light to come into the camera. You might want to make a very bright photograph and then you let lots of light into the camera. I'm simplifying things very simple, you know, I'm making things very, very simple here. But effectively, if you give your, if lots of, if too much light comes in, you get a, an overexposed picture, as you can see there on the right hand side. And if you underexpose, you don't get enough light in the camera, you get an underexposed uh, photograph. So we're looking for something called correct exposure, which is when the light gives you a nice range of details in the highlight and the shadows. Now, photography can do things that the naked eye cannot do, and that is capture movement. And one thing that a camera can do is to record movement. And the way to do that is to use your shutter, which is the, the thing inside the camera that opens and closes to let the light in. And if we leave the shutter open long enough, it will capture movement. And here's some examples of photographs that capture movement. In the top left-hand corner here, you have the sky blurring, uh, that's probably, a, a, depending on how fast the clouds are moving, but that might be a 10 or even 30 second exposure. The camera has been secured on a tripod or on a firm place, so the camera itself is not shaking, but it's just letting the light in. The picture here in the top right hand corner, you've got the actual stars going down the planet. So that may be, uh, I'm not sure whether he's done multiple exposures there, or whether that, that might be a 24 hour exposure. It may have been shot in the Arctic. Here in the bottom left hand corner, someone has, done, has moved while the shutter was open with a, with a torch to create this, this swirling light. And in the right hand here, this misty effect that we're getting, that's a very long exposure, it could be several minutes, and the photographers recorded the water coming in and out of the photograph. Can you guys still hear okay? Let's see if you can. I can't hear you and I can't see you either. So hopefully you can still see me. Chris, can you hear me? No, okay, so for some reason- it must Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, I've just unmuted. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great, lovely. Thank you. It's just I can't see you, so I'm, I'm just making sure you haven't lost me. Fair so enough. here's some example of, of shutter speeds. And the shutter is usually open for a fraction of a second when you take a photograph. And that stops your hand from shaking the photograph. So most of the photographs that you take will probably be around this area, sort of a 30th to sort of 250th of a second. So the shutter is open for a very short amount of time. And you can see this picture of the Ferris wheel, <coughs> the effect of, uh, of the shutter being open for, for a longer period of time, it captures more movement. And here's some other examples as we, as we leave the shutter open longer, uh, we call that a longer exposure, then you can record movement. <coughs> And sometimes it does magical things. So if you use a long exposure with water, you can get this lovely stream effect. If you use a short, uh, a short duration, short shutter speed, then you can freeze the, uh, the droplets of water. Again, you can capture movement. You can try this out at home with your new camera. And I'll be explaining how to do that shortly you can capture movement. So it's something very, very special, something that uh, artists, and, and there's very few things that can do this. Uh, it's, it's a unique thing that photography does. Now we're gonna to go to the aperture. So like I said, the, uh, the camera is a light type box with a shutter in it. And onto that, we put a lens and that allows us to focus an image <clears throat> and control where that focus is. So this again, this would probably be normally about an hour uh, sort of session, but I'm gonna go for it quite quickly. So essentially inside the lens, you have this diaphragm, uh, which, can, uh, which you can open uh, in different, different sizes. Essentially, we call the, the name given to these apertures are f-stops. And the smaller the number, the bigger the hole. So f2 is quite a big aperture, lets in lots of light. And as you click down, you've got control of this. You can go down to a small aperture, which is a big number. f16, for instance, is a very small hole. This has two principal effects. It controls the amount of light coming into the camera, but it also allows you to control what's what we call the depth of field or the depth of focus. So again, this is something that's quite special with photography. We can control what's in and out of focus. 
with a big aperture, okay, so that's a small number, f2, for instance, or f2.8 here, the photographer has only got a small amount in focus, it's got the hedgehog in focus. If we close the aperture down a little bit to f5.6, we get more depth of field. Therefore, we've got the hedgehog and the, the moose in focus. If we stop the, uh, the aperture light down, f11, f16, or even f22, we can get the whole scene in focus. So landscape photographers will often use a tripod to use a very small aperture to get lots of focus. Here's some examples where the focus has been controlled. In the landscape photograph here with the, with the bridge, the photographers probably used f22. Very small aperture. He's put his camera on a tripod, he's fixed it still, and he's probably had to use quite a long, uh, keep, he's probably had to keep the shutter open quite a long time because the aperture is so small, uh, and that's given him lots of focus. On the right hand side here, F2 gives a shallow depth of field. So you can see the dice are in focus, but the dice behind are out of focus. Again, something, something quite special that photography can do. The cat's eyes are in focus, but the background is out of focus. I use this a lot in my portrait photography when I want to make sure the messy background is, is blurred. It's not going to grab the attention. And I like using a shallow depth of field because it allows you to control where the viewer is looking. Okay, so there's all different kinds of lenses. The lens that you've got on your camera, if you've been, if you've been, if you've had a Panasonic delivered, or most of the cameras these days are delivered with a zoom lens. And that's got various focal lengths. Now, I won't, again, I won't get into too much detail, but the focal length of a lens is essentially how long it is. Okay, a short number, such as 24, tends to be a wide angle. If our eye was, was a lens, it would be around about 50 millimeters. And as we get longer, as we get a, a bigger number, a longer focal length, we call these telephoto lenses. And telephoto lenses, uh, have uh, have an effect whereby they flatten perspective. So that's the key thing that you need to know about lenses. Two things you need to know is that the focal length will affect the perspective. That's basically how much you get in the photograph. We'll look at some slides in a minute and I'll explain that in more detail. The other thing to consider is uh, they have different size apertures. Uh, my cameras are very, my lenses are very expensive because they have a very wide aperture. They have f2 or f2.8 as their maximum aperture. But cheaper cameras don't have such big apertures. Again, this is, might sound quite complicated. I'm going through it quite quickly, but essentially it's a bit of glass with a hole in it. This just gives you an example. The photographer, you, can, you should see before you five photographs. The photographer hasn't moved. The scene hasn't changed, but what he's done is he's used different lenses to give an, an example of how perspective is affected by the lens that you choose. I would say if we were standing in this scene, we would be seeing what the 70mm lens sees. But as we put a wide angle lens on, the perspective is exaggerated and things start to seem further apart. So the tree seems further away and the load looks wider. As we use a telephoto lens, a lens with a longer focal length, it starts to flatten perspective and bring, th bring the things together. You can obviously see things that are further away as well. So sports photographers will often use long lenses to try and uh, get a photograph of Jamie Vardy scoring a winning goal some distance away. Whereas landscape photographers will tend to use wide angle lenses because they want to get a lot of the scene in. So this, these photographs have all been taken. The photographer and the model have not changed position, but the lenses have changed. So you can see here with a very wide angle lens, a 60 millimeter lens, it looks like the buildings behind the girl are a long way away. And there's a lot of exaggeration in the perspective. Again, if we were standing there with our naked eye, we would probably see what the 50 millimeter lens is seeing, which is the girl standing there and the buildings there. If you use a very long lens, such as a 200 millimeter lens, the girl, it appears the buildings are very close behind the girl. This is one way that photography can kind of tell lies. It can make, for instance, it can make people seem like they're standing next to each other, when in fact there's some distance apart. Because photographers can be quite clever sometimes and use a long lens to draw people together. 
<clears throat> if you want to flatter people, you tend to use a slightly longer lens. It makes noses and ears look a bit smaller. If you want to take a photograph and make people look a little bit ugly, you'd use a wide angle lens quite close up and it would make noses look large and ears look small. So again, a few more examples of different lenses that are altering, controlling the perspective in an image. With these shots on the left, the wide angle lens is exaggerating perspective. And on this shot of the girl on the right, a longer lens has been used to flatter the perspective. So it's more flattering for her face. It also brings the background uh, in, in, in the shot a bit more. One thing to notice also is that wide angles tend to give you more focus, more depth of field, whereas longer lenses tend to reduce the depth of field. So again, a portrait lens, a telephoto lens, is good for throwing backgrounds out of focus. OK, so I've gone through that really quickly, and I'm just going to pause that for a second and just uh, let's just see if we can uh, just take away from that for a stay for a moment. Going to go back to that. So guys, did you all capture that? I know I flew through that very quickly, but that makes sense. Are there any immediate questions that you have regarding the camera, the shutter speed, and the aperture? Okay. Uh, so, like I say, it's Exactly the same in many ways as the camera that I, you know, you're using. It is just a light type box. And I can open this up and we can see inside. And coming in, and when we press the button, that shutter will open. And in the lens there, we can see that the aperture can be controlled using the F stops. <clears throat> now we'll have a little look if you've got if you had a camera delivered today then you might want to get this out uh, i know that probably there's, a, there's some of you guys have already got your own cameras so this bit might be a bit boring for you You don't have to stay on essentially i'll just be going through some of the buttons on on the camera i'll go back to the screen sharing Sorry, was I muted there? Can you hear me now? Chris? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Sorry, it, I don't know how it must have muted, muted itself. Okay, let me go back. <clears throat> Okay, so I was, I know I was just saying for such a small camera, it packs a lot in. Uh, these photographs have been taken using this camera, uh, so it's got a, a good lens, and you, you, you should be able to get some great photographs with it. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna quickly go through it. Gonna turn on the go through some of the basics on how to turn it on and off, how to charge it. Have a quick look at the lenses and some of the settings. So this is the camera from above and to turn it on 
you just quite simply use this button here on off. And you have a main dial here that lets you control some of the settings. Now I've set it for you. I've, I've formatted your cards and I put the strap and everything on and it should be on program. So straight from automatically set the aperture and the shutter uh, speed for you uh, so that you can uh, you don't have to worry about the exposure. You can just choose uh, uh, what to focus on. However, you can also use some of these settings and you can, well, why, if I, what I would do is suggest that you leave the, the handbook uh, and, and have a play. It has got a lot of settings on it. Uh, ones we'll be focusing on today are program, aperture priority and shutter priority. So as I say, with program, you literally point and shoot and it works out the exposure for you. On the uh, aperture uh, setting, you can control the aperture and I'll show you how to do that shortly and the camera will automatically choose the shutter. So aperture is a great choice if you want to control how much focus depth of field you've got in the, in the photograph. Shutter priority allows you to choose the shutter, and that's a great choice, and the camera will automatically do the rest of everything else for you. It allows you to control the movement in the photograph by controlling the shutter speed. And with manual, you'll need to set both the, expo the shutter and the aperture to get the correct exposure. Uh, just to show you, it, the, this is a, a, another main control. To take a photograph, uh, you use this button here, which is called the shutter release. And you've got an amazing zoom lens here. It's got this incredible focal length from 20 to 1200 millimeters, which is just crazy. Uh, and you can zoom in using, using this button here. If you push it to the left, it will go into a wide angle. And if you push it to the right, actually the other way around, sorry. <laughs> If you press it to the right, it will give you a wide angle. And if you push it to the left, it will give you telephoto. And again, you can just explore. You can just put it on here and you control the exposure here. And you can take a photograph using this and you control the zoom using this. If you want to take some video, it's got a 4K video characteristics, you use the red button here and you press that and it will start recording a video for you. Uh, one thing I should mention, there's a microphone over here, so if you're shooting video, try not to have that covered with your fingers. And also, if you are, these are got some little speakers here. Actually, I think these are probably the microphone, the microphones, so that's what's going to be recording the sound in your video. And I believe this is a little speaker, so that's going to be, when you do playback, the button of the camera is uh, actually it's hills and it's very dark and there's not a lot of light about it. if you press this button then this part of the camera will pop up and the flash will appear and it will, it will uh, provide some illumination Okay, Sorry, so that's just what, assuming what the flash again. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll come to that in a second. It's on the back of the camera oh, on the okay. top left hand corner with the button. It's got a picture of what appears to be like lightning. And if you press that, it pops the flash in. Ideally, you don't want to use that too much because that flash lighting is a bit flat and a bit boring. But if you're at a party or in a very dark room, then it'll certainly give you some illumination. So as I said, you've got the, uh, this is for taking the photographs. You can zoom in there. These buttons will probably come on to at a different date because they do, you can experiment with these, but they do get slightly complicated. This actually allows you to shoot multiple 4K photographs. And this one allows you to, uh, to, to do to do uh, to do a variety of settings you can set these as a good function buttons and you can set them to do what you want them to do but this also controls what's called the drive which we'll get to in a moment one thing that i should have told you first is uh, is where i charged it fully for you but in the box that i provided there should be a uh, uh, plug with a lead and that will go uh, 
into the side of the camera. I don't know if, can you, Chris, can you see me as well? You can see my camera as well. It seems that you can see my camera as well. Yeah. So I can't hear you, but. There oh, great. Go. Okay. So in the side, on the side of the camera, there's a little wind, a little door that opens there. And that allows you to plug in the USB cable. Like so, just be careful with these cameras, they're a little bit fragile, it'll be quite easy to break them. So that should slip in there. Don't force things, that should slip in there. And you can charge it either using your laptop or probably better to use the plug that they supply. It does take a long time to give it a full charge, it's 170 minutes, so it's best probably to leave it over, over overnight. When you're charging, a little dead light will appear on the top uh, until it's fully charged, then it will go out. So just keep an eye on that. It should last you for a long time. I've always, the battery soft socket itself is underneath the camera. You just press that down, it pops open. And to get the battery out, you just press this little grey lever, like so. Probably better to turn my camera off so I can see what you're seeing, but that's the, the battery. You can nearly just leave that in there. It doesn't need to come out. You'll also see that I've put a very large 64 gigabyte SD card in there, and all your photographs will go on there. I think you can take 6,000 photographs with it, so you really probably wouldn't actually need to take it out, but we will look at uh, saving the photographs later. I believe you can save the photographs onto your laptop using that USB cable, or you could take that out and use a separate uh, holder if you have one. So yeah, that's uh, that's for charging uh, the, uh, the battery. Uh, and the case that I brought is a bit of a tight fit. Uh, so it will fit in there, uh, personally, I, I, I put it, I hold the lens and I push it in so that the uh, base of the camera is on the back of the bag. Uh, do try and, uh, I've attached your uh, lens caps uh, to the camera and do, the lenses can get uh, quite dirty quite quickly. So try and keep the lens cap in place when you are using it. We might buy some UV filters to put on there to protect, to protect it. Okay, so we've looked at uh, how to zoom, and it is, like I said, quite spectacular. Uh, now, you'll see, if we go to the next slide, that's just a quick shot of the lens. As I say, just be careful, it's quite vulnerable to do if you bash it. So when you are wanting to take photographs, there's two ways of doing it. You could press this LV, the F button here, which is called the live view button. And if you press that, you'll then be able to look through the viewfinder here uh, and, and carefully control how you take your photograph. And that works, and you know, I'd probably recommend that for most of your photography. If you press the LV button again, it turns the live view off, and then you get to see the view on the back of the screen, which is probably how most of you are used to using it uh, when you take photographs with your uh, camera. Uh, with your mobile phones. Uh, so if I just do that now, uh, it goes to sleep sometimes after it's been on for a while, so you have to just turn it off and on again. Uh, and as I say, I press the live view button once and then I can see what I'm shooting on the back of the screen, along with lots and lots of different settings. Uh, there's various buttons here. This dial here is called the command dial, and that allows you to control the shutter speed and the aperture. We'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, the button over here with the flash on, as I said, is to activate the flash. When you've taken a photograph and you want to have a look at it, you press the green play button here, and it will show the photograph that you've just taken. And then when you've done that, you can zoom in and you can zoom around the photograph if you wish, uh, uh, just by using the actual zoom button allows you to zoom in to the shot. So just press, uh, as I said, press the green button to, to view, the view of the photograph, and then they can use the telephoto, telephoto button to zoom in, to have a look at the photograph in detail. And this main uh, dial on the back has got uh, various different options. It's got the central button there, which says menu, and then it's got around it sort of options up and down and left and right to choose uh, lots of other options. This camera has got hundreds and hundreds of different options on it at the moment. If you get stuck, just stick it on program, turn it off, stick it on program, and it will take great photographs. 
and then as you get more experimental, you can start exploring the different menus. Uh, if we go on to the next, so that's what this is the button I'm talking about there. Uh, if you want to, uh, when you're looking at your photograph that you've taken, if you press display, it gives you different options for displaying. I think I include, there we go. So when you press the button on the bottom right hand corner display, it will display uh, either the photograph that you've just taken, it will display the scene if you're about to take a photograph, depending on which mode you're in, sorry. Uh, at the moment I'm in uh, the taking a photograph mode, so it, it then displays all the information such as the uh, setting that I'm in over here, auto, uh, the ISO is auto, the exposure is correct. Uh, like I said, lots of buttons here, which we'll probably explore in future sessions, or you can need the instruction booklet. There are lots of YouTube videos on this camera as well, and lots of Google reviews. So if you've got, if you really want to explore what the camera can do, you can go on those and look for some more detail. Uh, what I will do is just tell you about a couple of options here that you might find interesting. So just going back to the display button, when you press play, if you press display, it will tell you all the different settings that the camera was set on when you took the photograph. So in this case, it was f2.8. Shutter speed was 60, and it told you that the flash was turned off from various other settings. You can see what, and I just have a little think about what it's telling you. So I don't know whether you can see that there, but f2.8 and f60 and, and 60. Uh, I've set the uh, the timer so whenever you take a photograph, it will be recorded on the photograph. I've set the, the, the clock for you and the the zone, the London zone. So that's the display button. Uh, here on the wheel. You, if you press menu, then things are really start to get quite complicated. If you've got your camera in front of you now, I suggest you do that, turn it on, press menu, and then you'll see a window will appear. And on the left hand side, you've got various options. So the top option is the record. Maybe if I turn my screen up, I can see you, we can do this together. Let's just go for the last few uh, pages. Yeah, let's just escape that for now. So, it's difficult talking when you can't actually see anybody, you can't see your own camera. So, yeah, so on the back, oh, let me try and close this. Sorry about that. Okay. So, yeah, if you press menu, you'll get all these different options that come up uh, in front of you. Uh, this, uh, yeah, again, using that wheel on the back, you can control. Uh, you can move it down that screen. I mean, you guys are familiar with using this kind of technology, so you'll find it a doddle to, to work to way through it. But you've got uh, the top section is basically recording. The next section is motion pictures. So that's, that's settings for your videos. Uh, you've got custom settings. I mean, I wouldn't worry too much about these because there's 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 a lot that you'll never really use. But perhaps as we get more uh, more experience, we could try these different things. One, one, one to be very careful of, when the tool uh, in the setup uh, menu, which has got the little spanner, on the bottom there's something called format. Now formatting is basically emptying your card completely. So I've already formatted your cards to empty them. But if you were to press that button, you could potentially, it gives you lots of warnings, but you could delete all the photographs that you've taken. Uh, I did that once on my daughter's camera, she wasn't very happy. Uh, so it's uh, just that one, you go over to there and it says format. I don't know whether you can see that very clearly, probably not anyway. Just, just turn it to be one. Uh, format is basically means formatting your card, which is emptying it of all the photographs. And then you've got, uh, finally, uh, you've got the playback option there, and there's lots of different ways of looking back at your photographs. And you can probably plug this into your TV and do a slideshow and show your photographs to your, to your family and friends. This camera's got Wi-Fi. Uh, I haven't really explored what that can do, but I think essentially as you're taking photographs, it could be sending the photographs to your laptop or to somebody else's laptop if you wanted. Uh, that's just a very quick uh, sort of demonstration of, of what's in the menus. If I just go back to this dial here, the main dial, there's a little button at the bottom. It's quite hard to do this upside down. And if you press that, so you press, this is called the 
it's called drive mode and also self timer. So the self timer is that you might want to explore. So you, you click on, so you've clicked on the circle there in the bottom section. It's gone to drive mode. It gives you various options. One of them is high speed. This is pretty cool. Listen to this. Woohoo! <laughs> so that's just taken, I don't know how many photographs that's taken, probably about five or six frames a second. So if you want to catch someone dancing or jumping or playing football, God, oh, that's so sexy. I used to find that sexy. When, when I started out, I, you have to spend, I'd spend about 300 pounds to get someone to go on the bottom of my camera to actually do that. My film camera, you have to, you have to pay a fortune to get something to do that. So this is all included in, in your canvas for free. Uh, but if you go back to drive mode, the one button that you probably will want to use is called the self timer. That's the circle. It's on the uh, right hand side. It's a circle with a little kind of line in it. Again, you, you probably know self timers. You've probably got them on your iPhones. And that just gives you a delay. So when I press that, it means now it gives a 10 second delay before it takes a photograph. So if you want to be in your photographs, just fix put your camera on a wall somewhere or on a tripod, and then you can run into the shop and get yourself in the photograph. And again, I think there's probably lots of options. Yeah, it says more settings. Uh, you can probably control how many seconds it waits for before it takes the photograph, and you can probably control how many shots it takes. Uh, so that's something to look at. That's the drive mode on the bottom of the dial. Have a play with it. If you're photographing a bird in the garden, you might use the, that drive mode. It's got this 4K burst mode, which I'm not 100% sure what it is. Let's do it again in a second. <laughs> so many buttons, there we go. So that does, so that's taking 4K photographs, which I think would be good if you were doing an animation or a sequence. I've not actually explored how works and what it does. Uh, what else can we just quickly look at? Okay, so on that dial, on the left hand side, it, uh, it says uh, it's got a little square with a little cross in it. And that's called AF mode. And that's a way of controlling your focus. So at the moment, the camera automatically, we haven't really talked about focusing the camera, but it does it for you. When you look for the viewfinder, or look on the back of the screen and go to take a photograph. When you hold down the shutter slightly, uh, it, it will focus automatically and it will tell you there's a little yellow box and that's what it's focusing on. But you can control how that works in the AF mode. Again, it's a bit of a, uh, an advanced feature that we'll look at. Hopefully if we can meet up next week or the week after and go out and do some photography together, I can show you that and we can have a play with it. But that's autofocus mode, which you might need if you start to do some advanced kind of focusing work. And then finally, okay, again, another, a button that you probably won't need is on the uh, right hand side, it's something called white balance. So it will say uh, WB. And <coughs> comes in different colors, in different wavelengths. And some lights give you a very blue light and some lights give you a very orange light. And again, at the moment, the camera is set for auto, it's auto white balance. It will do all that automatically for you, so you don't have to worry about it. However, when you get more creative, you might want to control whether your photographs are cold or warm, and you can do that using the white balance setting. Again, if you want to leave for the instruction manual or watch some of the YouTube videos, they'll, they'll probably give you some more information on that. Uh, and then finally, on that control dial. By the way, when you, if you get stuck on those control dial dials, if you just press menu again, it'll, it'll turn those off. Uh, so pressing menu, I'm just going to uh, click on this final button called ISO. Now, I'll explain this fairly, but again, it's on automatic. You don't have to worry about it. But when we used to take photographs on film, we would have to buy a film that was sensitive to what we were photographing. So they were given numbers. It's called ISO. Uh, if you were out in the sunshine, you would use 100 ISO. 
if you were in a dark room, you might use 400 ISO. And that was how sensitive the film is to light. Digital cameras do that as well. And they do that with something called the ISO. Uh, as I say, it's all set for you at the moment automatically, but controlling the ISO allows you to take photographs that are grainier or allow you to take photographs in very, very low light. Uh, it's something that you might, if you're more of an advanced user, you might want to start to explore. But for the moment, it's set automatically, so you shouldn't have to worry about it too much. Okay, so I know that was a real whirlwind. And if I was teaching that in, in a photography college, I think I probably would have spent most of the term teaching that. So I know I've squeezed it in, and I hope I haven't bamboozled you too much. But hopefully you're starting to, you've got these words such as focal length, which is the length of your lens. You've got things like aperture, which is the size of the hole in your lens. You know, for instance, that your aperture can control the amount of focus within a photo photograph, what we call the depth of field. You know that lenses can exaggerate perspective or flatten it. Uh, you've got hopefully a basic idea of how to turn your camera on, how to charge it, and how to take some photographs and videos. So, you can just go off now. And I really want you to take lots and lots of photographs. Uh, I want you to try, we talked about this in the last session. I want you to try looking up and looking down. I want you to try taking photographs uh, of big things and small things. I want you to point the camera at some of your family and some of your friends. Uh, I just want you to take lots and lots and lots of pictures. Because pictures, taking pictures is a bit like cycling lots and lots of miles. It makes you a better photographer. And then I want you to come back and start to share with the group. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry we haven't had a chance to talk about the photographs that you shared with us. I'm so pleased that you started sharing pictures with us. And hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about those in the future. But please, when you take a photograph that you really like, or perhaps you take a photograph that is a disaster, then please feel free to share it on the WhatsApp group. And we can look at it. We can laugh at it and we can uh, give you any tips that you need. Okay, but start, you know, this, this, this project that we're doing, it's all about, it's a bit like uh, what, is, what you get, what you, what you give is what you get, you know? So if you want to really get loads out of this then go out to lots of photographs, share lots of photographs with us, and then we can really start moving forward. Okay, guys, uh, I will put these uh, slides onto, uh, I'm not sure we're going to use a Google Drive or whether I'm going to email them to you, but I'll find a way of sharing them with you. Uh, but, you know, has anyone got any, any questions? Uh, I know I've talked to you for too long, but if any questions that, you, that you've got? Okay, well, the WhatsApp's there any time of day or night. If you get, you know, like I did last night, 11 o'clock, I suddenly decided I want to share some of my favourite favorite photographers with you. Feel free at any time, day or night, to, to ask me a question. Thanks, Stuart. That's excellent. A really good presentation. Um, so before we all go, just a quick word from me. I did mention yesterday that uh, we won't be holding the session on Monday next week. We'll be doing the session on Tuesday. And the Tuesday session will be a presentation by me about how you can start to think about the project that you're going to do as part of the heritage of our lives. So that will be the starting point for you to match what we've been talking about in relation to heritage and what Stuart has been talking about in terms of photography. And then for the remainder of the week, we'll have an opportunity to talk to people on a one to one basis to share some ideas to encourage you towards the kind of activities that you want to undertake over the next few weeks. So, so next week, it'll be Tuesday only. Um, I'll summarise all this in an email and send it around to everybody. And then the week after, we're hoping that, um, as Stu suggested, we might be able to go out and do some real photography in the open. Um, we might go into Leicester City Centre and take some photographs of people, buildings, dogs, cats, and everything else that's going on. So watch this space. So in terms of getting to know your camera, it's great if you can practice as much as you can over the next week, next two weeks, and then we'll be using them for real three weeks down the line. So at that point, hopefully you'll have enough control over your camera to be able to start taking some of the photographs that you might imagine in your in your head could form part of your project going forward. 
So I think that's all we have to say today. Um, big thank you to Stuart for the presentation and delivering the cameras. Um, that was a big ask, so thanks very much to him for doing that. And um, I put this presentation up on the YouTube channel. The presentation that Antoinette made yesterday will go on the YouTube channel later on this week, so you'll be able to see the slides from both presentations and reflect on them. And as Stu said, if you have any questions about the project or photography, then please feel free to either use WhatsApp or send us an individual email and we'll try to answer as best we can. But in the meantime, get your cameras working, go out and take some photographs, take pictures in house, out house, wherever you can. Familiarity is um, a really, really good thing to, to, to undertake, I think, over the next two or three weeks. Get familiar with the camera and then you'll start to take the kind of photographs that you are imagining in your head, I'm sure. So thanks very much for your input today. And if not before, we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.